Some of the thoughts in this video and my decision to read Emma itself have been influenced by a YouTube channel called Spinster Library. Do check out Claudia's channel, there's a link in the description box. She has plenty of videos on Jane Austen and they're all very well researched and very well argumented. Hi everyone, here's the book chemist once again and in the past I've read two uh, other Jane Austen novels other than Emma which I'm reviewing today and those were Pride and Prejudice when I was around 20 and a few years later Northanger Abbey and I enjoyed both of them, I liked them, I found them uh, funny and humorous and I appreciated the evolution of their plot, I especially appreciated Northanger Abbey tongue-in-cheek satire of the gothic novel which also clearly paid homage to the gothic novel and came from a place of great appreciation. I liked both but I wasn't truly blown away. I didn't really and fully see what all the fuss was about with Jane Austen. So that I always had it in my mind that one day I wanted to read another Austen novel and pay very close attention to it and finally make up my mind over whether I actually enjoy your fiction or maybe can't really see the point very much. I also knew uh, that fiction from that time period, 18th century fiction in particular, but early 19th century fiction too, I often struggle with its style and with its prose. I often struggle to be truly immersed in the narrative. And so I was a bit scared, let's say, when I, when I picked up Emma. I will say this, that I absolutely had no problem whatsoever feeling immersed in the novel. It was always a pleasure to read and I was always looking forward to the next session where I could invest one or two hours uh, in Highbury and in Artfield in the, the setting of this novel and spending some time getting to meet the characters and getting to see how the next party or the next excursion would play out. It was one of the greatest immersive pleasures I've had in a long time and it became even more alluring once I reached the second and the third book. The, the novel is split in these three books. I think the reason behind that, very simply put, is that when I, uh, when I told my fiance that I was going to read Emma, she totally spoiled the book to me because she said, you know it's basically clueless, right? Ah, that was so terrible! And the first book, uh, book one in the novel, is the one where uh, the movie Clueless follows the plot most closely, so I could kind of see what was happening between Mr. Elliot and Harriet and Emma and how the events would unfold. Funnily enough, I tweeted about the Emma Clueless connection recently. I am positive nobody got the joke and that people just assumed I was having a little bit of an episode. Emma is a treasure chest of literary genius and I loved it on so many different levels and I'll try and give a bit of a bullet point review where I cover some of the aspects that I appreciated the most from the novel. Uh, the, first, uh, the first part of the video will be completely non-spoilery. I'll, I'll warn you when I start talking about the plot, especially the later plot in the book. The first stroke of genius is obviously the protagonist, obviously Emma. Her psychological characterization is brilliant, not just because you get to inhabit her psyche and her trains of thought and her plotting and her plans for herself and her friends uh, in a very uh, in a manner that truly opens up her interior life to you, to the reader, but because the way the text handles this and the way you come to know Emma doesn't mean that you know the entirety, 100% of Emma's character. You get to know enough about her to form your own opinion on her. And just as in the very best of literature and fiction, what you bring to the book is as important as what the book gives you, as the, the material and the tools that the novel gives you so that you can build this little world in your mind, the world of these people and of these characters and their interactions and their setting. In particular, Emma has the same quality that you find in some of the genius characters of Shakespeare. Uh, I think of Cleopatra most notably, where in Anthony and Cleopatra, you can clearly read her as a scheming um, a ruler who's cl who clearly has a good sense of what's best, what's most convenient for her and for, the, for her to reach a position of power, but you can also read her as an impetuous, even naive woman who is transported by her emotions and her passions. And in a way, it's not like these two characters are mutually exclusive, in a way both of these sides coexist. 
and when you read the text these sites coexist in a very humane way i feel like these dichotomies these oppositions coexist within all of us and it's one of the the great values of reading and of books that they open up these contradictions to us in an understandable manner in a manner that makes more sense than our tangled thoughts and it's part of the reason why, you know, adapted Shakespeare, Shakespeare on stage, because the actor and the actress in this case clearly has to pick a side and to give a certain homogeneous characterization. You lose something there. But I'm going on a completely different tangent. What I'll say about Emma is that she's a character that follows that same kind, that inhabits the same kind of dichotomy. Emma is clearly a scheming character. It's kind of her main personality trait even. She always has plans for the people around her. She always wants to place Harriet with somebody or somebody else. She clearly is not scared to use her influence on people to reach her own goals. The dichotomy I was talking about concerns whether she does this from a place of good and from a place of kindness and a willingness to help others achieve what she thinks is the best life for them or whether she's just petty and manipulative and and scheming in a rather nasty way and even jealous she definitely can be very jealous uh, in a nasty way toward uh, the end of the novel and for all that I really liked Emma and I think she was a, a truly strong and very compelling character when I think back to the novel and when I think back to her behavior in the course of the book I get this strange suspicious suspicion that she is not that very dissimilar from the main antagonist in the second half of the book uh, and this awful, obnoxious, um, talkative woman from Bristol. She's not that dissimilar. Emma is not that dissimilar from... And the reason why I liked her more might just be that she is a bit more stylish and a bit more refined. Which is obviously awful and obviously something that I need to think about and one needs to consider when reading the text. The reasons why we come to feel compelled uh, by certain characters and we come to dislike certain others. The way these characters are presented is fantastic. It shouldn't work this well and yet it does. Austen is one fantastic, is wonderful at giving you just the bare materials you need, as I was saying before, without any superfluous element. This is especially clear, and uh, to put it in concrete terms, it's especially clear when it comes to the fact that there is very little description in this novel of Hartfield and Donwell Abbey and the other uh, manor houses where the novel, most of the novel takes place, of Highbury, of the countryside around this, uh, this uh, of the countryside of Surrey, you get a few descriptive passages, but not very much. And the same is true of the characters, of the people, peopling the novel. You, what you get to know about them, you get to know mostly through their actions and through dialogue. Cormac McCarthy has nothing on Jane Austen when it comes to building entire chapters on dialogue. For this reason, I am tempted to recommend an annotated edition because some of the historic reference, some of the references to items of clothing or tools and items that you would find around the house are maybe a bit obscure to the contemporary reader. They were definitely obscure to me. And because the novel spends so little time characterizing these things, uh, it's useful to have a few notes and annotations every now uh, and again. I really liked the Penguin Cloth Bound classic uh, edition of the book, edited by Fiona Stafford. Thank you so much, Dr. Stafford, for the beautiful job. Uh, the notes were very clear, very informative, and the introduction was truly enlightening and stimulating. Sometimes the introductions to these, you know, great classic works of literature are a bit pointless. They just cover, uh, I don't know, one critical approach from which the novel has been studied. But this was the very opposite. Uh, def uh, I read it after reading the novel, and I definitely got a nice, a great sense of the many ambiguities and the many linguistic and literary games going on in Emma and the reason why it keeps baffling and fascinating critics 
to these days, and readers most notably, even more than critics, because it is a novel that give, always gives you, I, I can already imagine how upon every new rereading, it always gives you new material and new approaches and new perspectives, and the way you uh, build these characters, the way you imagine the people that inhabit this novel is going to change based on your own experiences. Because, as I was saying, you build these characters yourself just as much as the text builds them, they come to life so much more clearly in your imagination than if they were just offered to you on a platter. Miss Bates and Mrs. Elliot and Frank Churchill and Mr. Knightley, I feel like I know them. I feel like I have a, a truly well-rounded understanding of what kind of people they are, and I look forward to this perspective shifting with future rereadings. Another thing I really liked, and another, and I think I, uh, I think I picked up on my with my other Austen novels too, especially Pride and Prejudice, is that for all that these works of fiction are supposedly concerned with these very close realities of this uh, social landscape with a few interconnected families spending evenings together, uh, dining at each other's house, and supposedly isolated from the concerns of the broader world, the broader world always intrudes upon the narrative, and in a rather jarring way, possibly because, for the very reason that this world otherwise looks like very much of a bubble, uh, Jane Fairfax's family being destroyed by the war is a big example. The general um, state of concern for international relationships, this idea that Frank Churchill might or might not be allowed to go on his grand tour of Europe, uh, depending on the Britain's relationships with France. Overall, the fact that at the time, the time of the Napoleonic Wars, a time of immense turmoil for Europe, this dimension still managed to intrude upon this landscape gives you a good feeling of the the kind of mentality and the way these events uh, influenced the culture of early 19th century Britain much more, I think, than if these events had been forced to the forefront of the novel. The fact that they percolate into the narrative, percolate into the lives of the characters, give you a, a clearer sense of how important they were in the conscience uh, and in the imagination of the writer at work. The other great historical unsaid in the novel relates to the profession of Miss Hawkins' family. It's mentioned in the book that they are merchants, but it's not quite, it's not stated what they deal in. And because of this reticence and because of the fact that they're from Bristol, uh, Fiona Stafford definitely um, advance this idea that they might be, Miss Hawkins' family might be involved with the slave trade. And the novels, by not truly stating it out loud, points at this fact and at the brutality of this trade that allowed this family to reach higher status into this world and to climb the social ladder by exploiting this inhumane and, and awful pursuit. The novel points a light, shines a light on it for fiction of that time that is much brighter than one might immediately assume. But you do need, of course, to read the work very closely and to uh, pay very close attention to it, or to read a very nicely annotated edition, like is my case, because obviously I would never have picked up on this and relied on the work of great scholars shining a light on these facets of the work. Speaking of great scholars, another stroke of genius in Emma is the way the novel's narration shifts into and out of the perspective of the characters and of the protagonist Emma in particular, in ways that come to shape the very, the very way the events are presented to you and that come to influence your understanding of the novel. The passage I'm going to read and talk about was pointed out by Professor John Mullen from UCL at a lecture at the British Library about the works of Jane Austen. And if you ever get the chance, once things open up again, to hear John Mullen speak, by all means do, he is contagious in his passion for Jane Austen, which is the, the good kind of contagion compared to COVID. Uh, he also wrote a book called What Matters in Jane Austen that I look forward to reading. It sounds awesome. In general, if you can get a hand on his writing on Austen, he's the greatest Austen fan I've met so far. And the passage he pointed out in that lecture is this, and bear with me because 
the innovative kind of narrative style you find here is truly very much of a big deal, even though it might not look like it at first. Uh, it's a passage that comes in the first book. Emma and uh, Harriet have stopped at Mr. Elliot's house, and because Emma is trying to push Harriet and Mr. Elliot together, she's convinced that Mr. Elliot is in love with her and he wants him to propose to Harriet, what she does is she manages to leave them be for a little bit, to leave them in another room while she talks to the housekeeper because she thinks that in these ideal conditions Mr. Elliot is going to propose. She, meaning Emma, was obliged to leave the door ajar as she found it, but she fully intended that Mr. Elton should close it. It was not closed, however, it still remained ajar. But by engaging the housekeeper in incessant conversation, she hoped to make it practicable for him to choose his own subject in the adjoining room. For ten minutes she could hear nothing but herself. It could be protracted no longer. She was then obliged to be finished and make her appearance. The lovers were standing together at one of the windows. It had a most favorable aspect, and for half a minute Emma felt the glory of having schemed successfully. Except she hasn't, and clearly Mr. Elliot hasn't proposed. Have you picked up what the stroke of genius is? It's the words, the lovers. The lovers were standing together at one of the windows. Clearly we know, and I think every reader, even if you haven't watched Clueless, we kind of know that Mr. Elton isn't that into Harriet. You can kind of perceive it all along. The stroke of genius is that because the supposedly third-person omniscient narrator should know better, why would he call Mr. Elliot and Harriet the lovers if we know that they're not? The text and the narrator calls them the lovers because it's focalized through Emma's perspective, because Emma thinks they're lovers and thinks they're going to become engaged and get married. And this sounds like it's nothing, it sounds like, oh, everybody could have done it, and not at all. This is the birth of modern writing, this kind of seamless focalization, it was, it's, it's what makes fiction writing immersive and complex and stylistically refined, and once again, modern. And the, this is just one example of the many ways in which this happens in the course of the novel, and it's hard to, un, to overstate how truly genius and effortless it all is. I'm going to talk more about the novel, but I'll cover more spoilery bits and I'll have to talk a bit about the plot, so if you haven't read Emma, by all means do. I cannot overstate how much I loved the novel. I was impossibly impressed and I can't recommend it highly enough. So, spoiler alert, who's your favorite character? My favorite character was totally Frank Churchill. I had a sense that there was something going on with him, but the reason I could never really figure out what was happening there, the reason why I was completely sidetracked when it comes, came to his character, to guessing what, what his heart really was, what kind of person he was, is that Jane Austen, much like another great British writer, Agatha Christie, cheats. The reason why many of Agatha Christie's novels and mysteries are difficult to unpack is because she is a bit of a cheat. She cheats or, you know, sidetracks you when she presents her information. And the same happens with Mr. Churchill, sorry, with uh, Frank Churchill in the novel. The reason why I always had this idea in my mind that Frank Churchill would turn out actually to be revealed as a villain is that Mr. Knightley dislikes him throughout the entire book. And Mr. Knightley is this obvious hunk who is clearly an upstanding, wholesome sort of man, and he is clearly the hero of the novel. And I had this idea that if Mr. Knightley dislikes Frank Churchill, that is a clear indictment of his character. Frank cannot possibly be a good person. And the really great thing is that it turns out that Mr. Knightley only really dislikes Frank because he's jealous, because he's convinced that Frank Churchill is trying it on with Emma, is trying to, uh, is either being courteous with her or is toying with her and just playing around with her and without truly being serious about her and about proposing. And this idea that even the character with most integrity of the novel can actually be a little bit petty and can let his supposedly steely character be influenced by these egoistical concerns. It's truly interesting and, and completely caught me by surprise. And yeah, Frank Churchill is a very effervescent character. I found him truly likable, even if by all means he is once or, once or twice in the book. Yet, yeah, says a bit of a dick to people, to Jane Fairfax in a couple of 
places is quite cruel. Um, he never visited his family, but at the same time, I'm like, well, but have you ever traveled from Yorkshire to Surrey? You know, I, I get it, you want to see your dad, but it's a long trip. Mr. Knightley is also actually, for all that I make fun of him, he is a character of great integrity, and he is a truly upstanding dude throughout the entire novel. There's that scene after the picnic to Box Hill where he's, he is quite honest with Emma and in a way apologizes for the comment, but also makes a point of telling her, well, you know, you acted quite awfully with Miss Bates, which can come across as harsh, and I'm interested to see uh, how you read it. But I also found that it took a lot of courage to tell somebody who you're clearly a bit smitten with that they're being an asshole to a, an otherwise harmless woman. And that was such a powerful scene, this idea that somebody can have this much integrity to call out somebody else on their bad behavior, the kind of bad behavior that these days we wouldn't even notice. Somebody makes an arch comment about uh, a bit of a, you know, a, a talkative old lady. We're all like, oh yeah, screw the old lady. This kind of great integrity, I found it truly moving, I must confess. Miss Hawkins, for all that she's obviously the worst, I think only Mr. Elton is worse than, well, Mrs. Elton, um, is also a, a, a nice bit of comic relief and there's a scene where they're picking strawberries at Donwell Abbey and you get the entire flow of her constant chapter and the fact that she comes to contradict herself and, and it's just, I'm not even attempting to read it because I couldn't possibly do it justice, I already uh, butchered another scene before but it is an impossibly hilarious scene um, and I'll point out where that happens in the book so that you can go and reread it and have a lol by yourself. The other bit of comic relief in the novel is obviously Mr. Voodoo's, but I must say Mr. Voodoo's is another one of those ambivalent characters where he is clearly funny because he's so scared of uh, drafts and because he cannot possibly attend a, a dinner um, at, you know, half a mile away in case it's too cold because everybody will die from the cold and that's so dangerous and, and all that stuff. But it's ambivalent because I'm not quite sure up to what point I should be laughing about Mr. Voodoo's. He's an obvious hypochondriac, but it's not very clear up to what point he's an imaginary invalid and up to what point he might actually be not all there anymore. There's a scene where Mr. Knightley walks in and the novel kind of says that, yeah, he basically told Mr. Voodoo's where he needed to sign and what needed to happen and the suggestion is that Mr. Voodoo's faculties might not be that sharp or that clear and uh, up, at a certain, at a few points in the novel it gets almost uncomfortable. He reminded me very clearly of the uncle in We Have Always Lived in the Castle, who is another character where you are never quite sure how fully aware they are of what's happening around them. Last thing, Mr. Suckling, isn't that the best Pinchonian character name you've ever read? And I'm done. I really loved Emma. I wasn't expecting to like it nearly as much. And I am smitten. I really look forward to discussing it in the comment section. As always, I really uh, and truly look forward to uh, hearing what you think about it. Emma in particular, I'm assuming, will be the, the, um, uh, the, the main point of attrition between readers. She looks very much like a lover or hater sort of character. Um, and I'd, oh, I'm also looking forward, after I uh, read more of Austen, Persuasion will probably be my next novel to reread, especially Pride and Prejudice. Which, my assumption, and I always had this idea, I think what happened there is, all, is that I, I read it too early and without paying it the attention it's, it deserves. Jane Austen definitely strikes me as the kind of author where if you only really read it for the plot, you can have a certain amount of fun with it, but if you spend more time with it and slow down and realize the intricacies of the, uh, of the narrative and especially of the character's development, it's just endless gold. Thank you so much for watching the review, thank you to my patrons for sponsoring the channel, and thank you all for uh, engaging with my thoughts on Emma. Uh, I'll see you in a uh, future video, and bye everybody.